there's life. There's an incubation that has begun. And there's something in the womb of God's kingdom. And it's going to be born. Something's coming. But you don't know what it is. And if you figure it out, God will change it. Because he's done with us super managing his moves of God. So in this life, as we prepare, we have to understand that everything begins and ends. There's nothing that's static. Everything is progressive. So adaptability should be embedded in your Christian walk. If you're not adaptable, you're really in trouble. If you don't know how to change and say, I was wrong, not about the principle, but applying it in that season. If you don't know how to say God is emphasizing something more here than he was there and I need to shift over here, you're really, you're, what, you're walking in yesterday's anointing and you do not want to be yesterday's man, ask Saul. He was mighty. He was appointed of God. He led a move of God. He had a great revival. He killed God's enemies. He ruled Israel. But because he would not change, he was yesterday's man. And David was today's man. You don't want to be yesterday's anointing. You don't want to set in yesterday's river. You want to move on with God because the kingdom of God is not a static swimming pool. The kingdom of God is a river that never stops flowing, that changes from depth to depth to depth to depth, even by the glory of the Lord. Get in the river and you'll have new scenery every second in your life. I know someone said, that's not scriptural because God never changes. No, God doesn't, but you sure should. Because we're so far away from God and, and being like him that someone has to change. And guess what? God doesn't change. We're on a head-on collision with God, and his forehead is stronger than our forehead. He's not going to change like us, but we're going to change like him. That means your journey is forever readjusting, recalibrating, rechanging, reshaping, forming, and molding into the image of Christ. And if you think you've arrived, the spirit of stupid is all over you. It's like you fell out of the stupid tree and hit every limb on the way down. If you really think where you're at is the ultimate apex of your destiny and everybody should follow you there because it is a journey and you're just another step closer to your destination and hope to God that we make enough steps in our goal, in our purpose, that we reach our destination. We don't feel uncomfortable standing in our destination. I have a suspicion that some Believers might feel more comfortable somewhere else if you don't understand the atmosphere of heaven. And when you make it, listen, that's all right. If you're not at the throne, you know, for a while, hey, the back seat in heaven is still better than the first seat in the other place. So it's all right. Let me end this. So then if we're in the continuum of womb to tomb, then that means everything has an has an incubation date and everything has an expiration date. You need to know, if you, if you have an incubation date, you know that's already happened, but Christians rarely know their expiration dates on what they're doing. They don't know how to shift. We don't know how to change. We don't know how to, to redefine, to reposture, because we think we've arrived. But expiration dates are important. If there wasn't an expiration date on the law in the Old Testament, Christ wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be this progressive outpouring of God's revelation. But there was an, for the old law was done away with and fulfilled in Christ. That's a broad sweeping view of expiration dates, but there's many expiration dates. The Azusa revival, it was incubated by God, but he had an expiration date. Every revival I've ever seen was born by God, but it always peaks and always goes, and God brings another. Everything has an incubation time and an expiration date upon it. And here's the problem. Every jar of food you get says an expiration date on it. Have you ever eaten food after expiration date and think, well, I didn't kill me? Bah, 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 God, I'm still good. Give me another one. It's all right, but be careful. You're playing with dynamite because... You're running the risk of getting food poisoning. You're running the risk of eating something that's not compatible for the season that you're living in. You're running the risk of getting sick and not being able to run with the next jar that God is sending out. you got to be very careful to eat what God and operate how God wants you to operate. And eat what God wants you to eat in the time season that you're in as a prophetic people, as Issachar. You should know, I should know the times and seasons of God. 
And we should know when that season's expired. So many seasons in my life have expired, and I've had to move on to other seasons. My season, I love Arkansas, I was born and raised there. My season expired in Arkansas when I was 34 years old. And if I would have stayed, the angel of the Lord stood in front of me and said, if you don't go here and you stay here, you will die a premature death. So understanding your seasons is insurance against premature death. To, hop, to rightly position yourself in the right place for the right need at the right time. Case in point, we'll close. Joseph was a model of a man that knew how to shift when his expiration date was over. Adaptability was his access point into his next assignment. You understand what I said? Adaptability and going to where God wants you to go is your access point to your next assignment because he sent his angels before you to prepare a place for you. So what you're wanting God to do here Angels have already prepared and are waiting on you there for you to get there. We look, have you ever felt like, where'd my angel go? He is so far ahead of you, waiting for you to get where you're supposed to go because he's setting things up for you there. Joseph had a dream, had a vision, was a prophetic man with a prophetic ministry who was a teller of dreams. And you know the story. He told his Listen, when you're a young, prophetic guy, you should be careful telling stuff to half-brothers. You know what a half-brother is? They have the same daddy with a different mama. And in the church, that means half-brothers and the Christ are they're saved and they love Jesus, but they've been raised by different religious institutions. They've been mothered by different organizations. Be careful what you tell half-brothers. They're your brothers and you love them, but you got to be careful. Uh, we call it, well, Joseph was prophetic. No, Joseph had, his mouth was loose. Have you ever told someone your dream from God and found like Joseph, you're sent out on a one-way missionary trip? <laughs> so Joseph says he's to rule the world. God's brought him into this great, amazing place and his family's bound down to him. The world's bound down to him. He finds himself in a pit in a well, betrayed by his brothers. And for 13 years, this man goes through the craziest stuff from one place of testing to another, to another. He finds himself as a dreamer and a prophetic dream interpretator. In Arkansas, we call it an interpretator <laughs> with all the condiments, interpretator, <laughs> baked. So he's in the prison and all he has, <laughs> he, but he's adaptable. He adapted to, to Potiphar's house until he ran into Jez. And then he adapted in the prison, and they made him head over the prison. He was so adaptable, he started a church with two people, a butler and a baker. He's called to rule the world, but he knows how to survive and adapt in extreme places on his journey. You know the story, I've said it a hundred times. He has a prophetic uh, school. And every week he prophesies, he prophesied over one of his students, uh, the baker, and Pharaoh killed him. He's got one left. This church is half the size it used to be. <laughs> but there came a day when adaptability was about to catch him, and he had to change. And Pharaoh has a dream. The butler remembers a guy in prison who was a little prophetic guy who had World Outreach Center, jail ministry, in the prison. He and, he and, a, and, a, and he said, I know this guy. Now listen. And so they sent for Joseph. He had a long beard because the Hebrews considered a long beard wisdom. And to, for a Hebrew to cut his beard is a no, 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 no. That's, you, you would humiliate in war a Hebrew if you cut their beard. That's why you know you had conquered them. And they come down and said, corporate Egypt needs to talk to you. There's a shift coming. He must have known it. It said he shaved his beard. He changed his clothing. He had enough confidence in God to, to adapt to the culture that he was about to walk into. And as he walked into the place and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, the CEO of corporate Egypt who had a dream, 
without him knowing that his connection and adaptability to connect with the marketplace was about to save the whole church years later down the road. And his own father. Matter of fact, his whole reason for being there probably wasn't about him. It was about the covenant God made with Jacob, his father. You, Joseph, was a pawn to be able to cause Jacob, whom God made a covenant with, his dad to survive in a time of drought. Sometimes we think we're big stuff. We don't realize we're just a pawn being used to someone of our father or some other whatever that God has made a covenant with. I mean, he was a wonderful man. So, but he, he takes up on, and listen to this. He had a gift shift in one day. He had a ministry shift, a gift shift in one day. When he prophesied, when he interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh gave him the ring and said, sit here, now take control of the land. He went from prophetic office to apostolic office in one day, from the dungeon to the throne in one day. And there's no history of him ever interpreting a dream after that, ever prophesying over that. He went into administrative anointing overnight. He had an adaptable gift shift happen in his life. It's in the Bible. He went from prophet to marketplace apostle. He went from broke with nothing. Now, now get this. I'm not, I'm not advocating this. But to be in Pharaoh's court, he had to shave his head, illegal for a Hebrew. He had to wear an earring. I'm not advocating. You need to do that. And he married the king's daughter, who wasn't even a Christian. You know why? There was so much God in this man and so much adaptability in this man for God to use him that God knew when he sent him in there, they would not influence him. He would influence them no matter what he looked like on the outside because God gives a flip about what you look like on the outside. For God does not look on the appearance. We have created whole organizations and whole religious movements around dress and appearance and rules and regulation. So God doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the inward, on the heart of a man. So he is wearing lipstick and eyeliner. No, not lipstick. No, don't. You know what he's wearing? All the Egyptians in power had to wear eyeliner. I'm not advocating you need to do this. I'm just saying that he wore eyeliner. I mean, this, you got to be secure, as Bob Jones says. I'm secure enough in my masculinity to do anything God tell me to. That's pretty secure. It goes from Duck Dynasty looking in the bottom of prison. He's the prophet that can't stop it. You know, and he's like, man, and the two wear an eyeliner, shaved head, probably a ring in his ear. And, 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 rub, and, and guess what? He's the same man he was when he was in the prison. He hasn't changed. Matter of fact, he's even more strongly anointed because God was working the law of adaptability to him to get him to his destiny because the angels that were preparing his place had gone before him years early and were waiting in Pharaoh's throne to give him the interpretation of that dream. And so when he gets there and steps into that place of adaptability, he realizes that it takes courage to change. It takes flexibility. It takes trusting God. It takes not doing the same. Aren't you just tired of the same old, same old, same old, same old, same Like I am so allergic to the same old, same old, same. I am so bored, oh, bored, oh, bored, same old, same old. I've never heard that. I've done that. I've been there. I've done that. God, please give me a breath of fresh air. Well, it's over there in uh, Pharaoh's. I'm not going over there, bless God. The scripture says, separate yourself from the unclean thing. And, you know. Well, he said that to Israel because they were fluctuating in their commitment to God and they were weak of character and he couldn't trust them to interact with the world. But Joseph, he could trust because Joseph says, the scripture said, the word of the Lord tried Joseph in the prison. He was a man of character. He was a man who was solid inside. When God can trust you, he'll send you to the world so fast it'll make your head swim. When God can trust you that you will change corporate America, he will have you standing in the door of corporate America. I'm telling you something. <coughs> Pharaoh is not coming to this conference. Pharaoh is not coming to your church. And sooner or later, God's going to have to trust us enough to release us with a jailbreak from our prisons so that we can get out into the marketplace and begin to change the landscape of America and of the world to provide for the coming famine and the hard times so that prosperity reigns in the church and in the house of Jacob and in Egypt and all is well because Joseph's know how to do gift shifts and adaptabilities and to change and to morph into what God has called them to be. The greatest wisdom you can ever have is to know when your season's over. I have seen man after man that I love die and go to heaven. They're not with me anymore. I've known them for decades and decades who didn't even realize their season was over 
and they walked right out of this life and stepped off the bluff of returning to the next life thinking they were going to another conference to preach and looking for the green room and they realize they're in heaven. I, I, maybe that, you know, like, oh, David says, no, 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 Lord, show me my days. Number my days and show me my times because I want to make the transition with dignity and I don't want to overrun my season. I want to be adaptable enough to know when my expiration date is there because every expiration date is an indication of a new date that God is stamping you with and a new place that God is bringing you to. You can't begin until you end. I'm on, okay, I'm closing. There is an expiration date stamped on the status quo of the church in America right now. And it's been a nearly somewhere close to eight to 10 years it's been on there. And it's getting harder and harder to eat the food. Because God wants to give us manna that's sufficient to the day he gives it. Because manna that's eaten from yesterday or day four has worms in it. So God has fresh manna for the church, but we're so stuck in the way it always was, that we cannot believe God moved the cheese. <laughs> Why would he do that? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, he is, but he's so trying to get us to change. So that there's an expiration date. And by the way, when you get to that expiration date, if you're there, if your season's over, you have a new season, don't try to redefine that new season. Don't tell God what it's supposed to look like. Because every person I meet that believes in the revival coming think it's coming in the image of their own ministry. If you're prophetic, there's a prophetic of revival coming. If you're signs and wonders, there's a signs and wonders revival. If you're, if you're uh, grow legs, there's a leg growing revival coming. If you're, you know, and so like, listen, when a baby is in the womb, you, all you know is two things. There's life in there and something's coming. You can't tell without an ultrasound. And that's what prophetic people are. We're ultrasound. You can't tell without a vague picture, whether it's even a boy or girl, what color of hair it has. All you need to know, does it have 10 fingers? Does it have 10 toes? Does it have two ears? And two, then it's all right. Whatever it is, all of the stuff doesn't matter, and you'll know when you need to know when it's time for it to be born, not before. So I want to tell you as a prophet, prophetic person, pastoring, which is really a really sneaky thing God just did for me. But anyway, let me tell you this. There's life. There's an incubation that has begun, and there's something in the womb of God's kingdom, and it's going to be born. Something's coming, but you don't know what it is. And if you figure it out, God will change it because he's done with us supermanaging his moves of God, marketing them. He's done with that. And the next move of God that's coming, we're right at the very edge of it right now. It's going to take reposturing. It's going to take being in the right place. It's going, to be, it's going to take humility and adaptability. Paul said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. The word time there is kairos, which is an appointed season or appointed moment before the foundations of the world. You have appointed moments in your life. You need to find out where they're at and get in them. <coughs> so it's coming. I don't know what it is. When I was a younger prophetic guy, I knew everything. The older I get, the more I don't know nothing. And the closer I get to God, the more I know that I don't know what I don't know that I don't know. All I got one prophetic word is like, duh. <laughs> I just know something's coming. And I refuse to predetermine ahead of time what it's going to look like. I refuse to buy baby clothes for a boy when it's going to be a girl. I refuse to get one set of clothes when it's twins. I, re I am not going to predetermine what the sovereign age, uh, God of the ages has determined to do because he is Jehovah's surprise. And the serendipity of God is going to overtake us and an accidental surprise is going to so thrill us that we're going to say, thank you, Lord. I never saw that coming. But you do what you need, not what we think we want to do.